Okay, and welcome back. Uh, first, this is an important week. We are one week out from the midterm. So I want you to all be prepared for that. Uh, the midterm drops on June 3rd, and you can take it any time from the 3rd to the 5th. So make sure you're caught up on all the lectures. Second reason this is an important week is that we're finally getting into what is the most foundational period for Western art, and that is classical Greece. What happens to make Greece such an important part of the Western tradition? And so this Wednesday and Friday, we're going to talk about that. So let's get started. So you've seen this map ad nauseum. You're probably sick of it now. Of course, we know that towards the end of the Bronze Age, we have this massive conflict, perhaps the Trojan War, perhaps something else, where we have a complete collapse of Mycenaean civilization. And this ushers in the Greek Dark Ages. This, of course, causes the mass chaos known as the Sea Peoples and the Bronze Age collapse, where for several hundred years now, we're not going to have much in the way of civilization in ancient Greece. Uh, many civilizations were destroyed, and the Greek civilization was one that was devastated the most. You're not going to see much in Greece for the next 300 years, 300, 400 years, other than a few small villages and goat herders. That's it. That's why we call this the Greek Dark Ages. So when things start in this region, again in the Aegean, in Greece, they're going to start slow. Again, here's the map to orient you. I want to stress again that uh, we tend to think of places like Thrace and Macedonia, Thessaly in this region. We tend to think of this as part of Greece, but this was actually not part of Greece anciently. Greece is actually the lower Aegean, and it's really defined by this set of regions here. In the Peloponnese, Attica, and then on the other side of the coast, Ionia, Doria, and then Crete to the southern end. So let's talk about pre-classical Greece. The Greek Dark Ages don't have any set dates. Somewhere around the year 1200 is when this Bronze Age collapse happens. And up until about the year 800, there really isn't much going on. So it's about a 400, 500 year period where we don't see a lot of, we, of well, we see no major art, no major buildings, nothing of any significant scale. No city-states, no independent kingdoms or large settlements. It's not until the 9th century and well into the 9th century that the independent city-states, uh, the polis or the polis, uh, start to form. Some areas are more tribal and they form actual kingdoms with kings, but some you know, create completely different forms of society. Athens goes on to become a nation democracy. Sparta becomes a kind of fascist, proto-fascist state. And the art being produced at this time is very, very simple. We call it proto-geometric because the first identifiable style, style that we can recognize in uh, this uh, you know, pre-classical Greece, this post-Bronze Age Greece, is the geometric style. And this stuff isn't quite there to the geometric style yet, so hence we're going to call it proto-geometric. You can see it's very simple, very simple uh, stylized decorations. In terms of buildings, we only have very simple buildings. This is the Harun. Um, this is a hero or ancestor shrine of some kind. Very simple building in Lefkandi, Greece. Has a very simple stone foundation. And then it would have had just a A-frame structure over the top of it, supported by wooden poles. Uh, looking very, very simple. From these very simple roots, we then break into some distinct periods, which are recognizable because of the stylistic differences. First and foremost is the geometric period. We're going to see simple wooden structures come back in. We're going to see geometric pottery. Then we have a period called the Orientalizing period. Uh, this is where influence comes from the Orient, from the East. Of course, that always confuses people. When we say Orient, we almost always mean the Far East, places like China, Japan, Korea. But Orient in anthropology and archaeology and classic studies just means anything east of Greece. And so this is the Near East. These are places coming from the Eastern Mediterranean, influenced from cultures like the Phoenicians, cultures like the Persians, cultures like Assyrians, Babylonians, those people who are in the Eastern Mediterranean. And then we're going to go into the Archaic period. And the Archaic period is where the first monumental sculpture starts to appear, and it ends with the Persian Wars. Uh, precisely somewhere around the time of the Battle of Marathon in 490 BCE, but we'll talk more about that. 
So it doesn't mean that things aren't happening. Here's the Iron Age 2 and Iron Age 3, and you can kind of overlay the styles on top of that. And after about 490, we're into the early classical period. So some things that are being developed even at an early date, one is the Olympic Games. Greeks loved sports, they loved games. The Olympic Games is only one of many games. There were the Pythian Games, there were all kinds of games. Some were played every, you know, four years, some every nine, some every three. And there were different cycles. There were all kinds of uh, athletic events that they would come together. This is also the era when Homer writes down the Iliad and the Odyssey. So the great epic myths of Greek mythology, which tell the story of those Bronze Age heroes and probably the collapse of those Bronze Age heroes, is written sometime down in the 8th century. And so we start to see independent Greek city-states form. Then we see this long period of development until we have a conflict, and the conflict is with Persia. And this becomes one of the defining periods of Greece. And we'll explain why later, but a, uh, some several important battles happen. Marathon, Thermopylae, Salamis. We'll talk about those in detail. Then Greece, after the Persian Wars, unifies. Remember, they're not unified up until that point. They unify into a thing called the Delian League, and that kind of overlaps with a thing we call the Athenian Empire, where Athens comes to dominate this al alliance that was formed amongst the Greeks, and ultimately this is what causes problems, because then we have a war between the Athenians, who want to dominate this alliance, and the Spartans, who have no interest in being part of this alliance. So let's take a look at geometric period stuff. One, bronze comes back. So even though iron becomes the uh, choice for making weapons and tools, bronze is still around, and still a very valuable material, and it's very easy to cast, and so we see it being cast into small figurines. Most of these are very small indeed, not more than about four or six inches. The horse here is about eight inches, so not very large things at all. And we call these the geometric bronzes. They're solid. They have very simple forms. You can see how the horses are often divided into extraordinarily stylized uh, you know, features. They're almost broken down into kind of geometric blocks. And the same thing is true for the pottery. And you can see right away why we call this the geometric period, because all of the features and all of the decoration is geometrical. So we have what's known as a Greek key. This motif here is called a Greek key motif, and it's going to show up forever. We have checkerboard patterns. We have zigzags, what we call chevron patterns, and a whole host of other patterns. Even when we see figures like horses and people on chariots, or standing figures, you'll notice their bodies are made up out of triangles and very, very simple forms. So even the figures themselves are very geometric. One of the most famous uh, artifacts from the geometric period is this vase. This is an attic geometric funerary vase. This one's currently in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. As you can see, it's quite large. Uh, it's nearly uh, five feet high. And this is a funerary vase. It was a common feature in Greek culture that when someone died, you would put a vase on their grave, and this vase would be a place where you could pour uh, libations. A libation is a liquid that you pour in honor of someone who is deceased, or perhaps a god, something of that nature. So you could pour oil into this, you could pour wine, there's lots of things you could pour into it, and you'd come back and fill it up. We just passed Memorial Day here, we take flowers to graves, uh, they would actually have vases and sometimes fill those vases with offerings of oil or wine. Uh, sometimes these vases have false bottoms, so they're like only the top inch is full. So it looks like it's a full vase, but it's not really full. Uh, this one, however, was probably made for somebody very important, and it's a full vase. And it actually has a funerary scene on it. So as we go to the vase itself, first of all, you'll notice, again, it has this very strong geometric decoration. It has the Greek key across the top here. And you can see that it has these figures. They're made mostly out of triangles and very simple forms. On the lower level, we see warriors and chariots and horses. These are probably funerary games. It was a very common practice in the ancient Greek world to have funerary games. You actually read about this in the Iliad, that after Patroclus uh, gets killed, Patroclus puts on Achilles' armor and pretends to be Achilles because Achilles won't go out and fight. And he does this to try and inspire people. He ends up getting killed 
And so Achilles honors him by having games, chariot races, contests of various types. So that's probably what this is meant to be depicting. And right here on the center panel, right there, and you see in the enlargement, is the funerary, uh, the, the funeral itself. You can see that a canopy has been put over the top of the deceased. The deceased's body is made up of just a triangle. His head is almost an, a simplified down to an eye. It's really kind of interesting. He lays on a funeral uh, bier. Animals, which are probably sacrificial animals, are below. And then we have figures that probably represent his family and his loved ones here. You'll notice that these people here, they have these kind of box-like arms. They're actually reaching up to tear out their hair. That's what they're doing. This is a universal expression of grief in the ancient Greek world, and you'll see this everywhere. The tearing of clothes or the tearing of hair. Uh, you're tearing your hair out as a, as a sign of grief. And you'll notice that he's flanked by large groups of mourners who are all tearing their hair out. This is probably hired mourners. We know that it was a practice in the ancient Greek world to hire mourners to actually, uh, you know, do these wild and outrageous displays of grief at your funeral. Nobody wants to have a funeral where nobody shows up and grieves. So you have professional mourners. Uh, and that's evidence that this was probably a, a very early practice in ancient Greece. Well, from the geometric period, we go to the orientalizing period. So again, we see an influx of themes. Now again, this is in the Far East, not China, Japan, Korea. That's way too far away. But this is the Near East. So this is going to be the Eastern Mediterranean, Phoenicians, Canaanites, uh, a little bit of Egypt, but mostly from places like Assyria, Persia, Babylon. These are the sources. And we're going to see Griffins. Griffins are a theme that we've seen all over the Eastern Mediterranean. You're going to see composite supernatural creatures, frontal figures, and some cult statues. One of the biggest things we see are cauldrons. Again, cauldrons are things where you offer libations. You pour in liquids as an offering to the deceased, to your ancestors, or to the gods. And these cauldrons are often going to have very elaborate decorations. Here's one of these cauldrons. Uh, and this one has an elaborate stand. On the stand, you can notice that it has one of these winged sphinx creatures. You can see it there. So it's looking very much like stuff we see from the Levantine coast, from Har Megiddo and other locations. And then it has these handles, or protomes, these you know heads, in the shapes of lions and griffins. Here's another one of these cauldrons that has these lion heads all facing inward. This one was found in Olympia, Greece, which is down in the Peloponnese. Very elaborate cauldron with these griffin heads. It also has uh, these handles. So if you look at these handles, these handles are in the shape of uh, bird-like creatures, but with human faces. So here's another one that came off of a cauldron. Here's a, a view of what these griffins look like close up. So this is all very stylized, and you can see the influence. So Greeks are coming into their own. They're seeing all of this rich material culture coming from the ancient Near East, and they're mimicking it. They're mimicking it in their own style, adding their own spin to it, but it's definitely coming from that region. You can see the same thing in the pottery. So the pottery, likewise, is going to have these sphinx-like creatures here. So you're going to have very kind of sharp edges. When we look at these dogs and uh, chasing rabbits, or we look at these boars facing off on each other, you see the sharp edges delineating their muscles. Looks very much like what we see with Assyrian stuff, which would have been contemporaneous uh, to this object. But we then start to see them come in with themes or scenes that are more uniquely Greek. This wonderful vase uh, has uh, a number of things that we recognize from Greek mythology. First off, on the belly of the vase, we have these terrifying female creatures. You can see they're wearing dresses and they have one leg out, uh, but their faces are these monstrous faces and they have snakes coming out of their hair. These are the Gorgons. These are uh, the monsters like Medusa from the story of Perseus. Uh, we have a boar and a lion facing off on the shoulders. And on the neck, we have this remarkable scene, which we have a, a detail right here. And this is one of the most famous scenes in Greek mythology. This comes from the Odyssey. Uh, the Odyssey is, of course, of, about Odysseus. Odysseus is one of the heroes of the Trojan War, and he spends 10 years of the Trojan War only to spend the next 10 years just trying to get home. 
uh, going from one misadventure to the other. And one of those misadventures is he's trapped in the cave by the Cyclops Polyphemus, or Polyphemus if you prefer. And so Polyphemus is here, and they actually get past the Cyclops by waiting for him to sleep, and he and his men gather together and they take a hot poker and burn his eye out. And this makes him blind so that he can't see when they sneak out. He tries to stop them by, uh, you know, feeling, but they cling to the bellies of sheep so that they can get out. When we look at this, you can see that their eyes are, you know, kind of forward eyes. Their profiles are very simple. The bodies are rendered very simply. Um, you know, there's uh, no kind of consistency. The faces are kind of uh, white, and sometimes the bodies are painted in black. But Odysseus here is painted light colored. So there's a, a variety of techniques going on. Here's another example. This is the very famous cheeky vase. And in this case, we see a procession of figures. We see individuals on horses. And what, what's interesting is, if you notice that none of the Minoan art styles have survived, the Minoan art styles, which had this all-over surface decoration, where it was about art for art's sake, and it was for the aesthetic purposes, and no matter which way you looked at it, all of that is gone. All of that Minoan sense of space is gone. Instead, what we have are clear registers broken up, and those registers have narrative stories. So this is much more like what we see Mycenaean. So whatever part of the uh, Minoan uh, aesthetic that existed did not survive the Bronze Age collapse, but something of that Mycenaean uh, did. When we look at these details, again, we see figures on horses, uh, individuals hunting down here in the lower level. In the upper level, we have soldiers. And you'll notice the soldiers are facing off to each other. They're wearing their very uh, wonderful Corinthian-style helmets. Uh, notice that they have on greaves to protect their lower legs, and they have these very elaborate colored shields. This guy over here is playing a double uh, flute, because, of course, if you go to music, you go to war, you need to have music. But mostly they just line up one after the other. Uh, there's a little variation in the legs, but not much. It's very stylized, looking very much like, you know, Assyrian art. We do start to see a return to large-scale statues. These are the first monumental statues and objects that we'll see since the Bronze Age. Um, and they're very, very simple. They're going to be frontally faced. And these are usually what we call cult statues. Cult statues are statues that are used in religious worship. So a statue that just illustrates a story is just a work of art. But a statue that you are expected to make offerings to, that embodies the presence of the god. Just remember how we talked about presence and likeness? Here's a case of presence again. This is a cult statue uh, that functions in religious worship. And this clearly was some kind of early cult statue. When we look at the statue, uh, it's very, very thin. When you look at it from the side, it's very flat. So it's almost like a relief uh, that's been stood up and carved on all sides. It's not quite sculpture in the round. Uh, sculpture in the relief is, of course, it's attached to a ground. Sculpture in the round is you can go around it. So while this is technically sculpture in the round, it's obvious that the artist is still thinking of this as a kind of relief, and it's really only meant to be seen from the front. They get a little better. Uh, they get uh, you know a little better at fleshing out uh, the human figure. Uh, and one of the things that emerges is this thing we call the Daedalic style. The Daedalic style has these very stylized figures. No real accurate anatomy at all, no accurate drapery. Instead, we have very stylized patterned hair. Uh, this is the Oxair goddess. And here's another one. This is a Daedalic figure. This is a small bronze. One thing I will point out is that one of the curious features of Greek art is the male nude. Not the female nude. Everybody thinks that Greeks are into nudes indiscriminately. That's not true. Uh, actually, female nudes, particularly in the early period, are pretty darn rare. Uh, but the male nude is an interesting thing. This guy, he has a belt, but not much else. And so everybody asks, why? Why are male nudes so important? We'll get into that, but Greeks loved sport, and they loved athletics, and athletics were performed... Uh, al fresco, shall we, shall we say. They were performed in the buff. And so the nude male was this kind of idealized form of, of male of masculinity. It's this idealized form of uh, male masculinity that he represents this vibrant ideal 
person, an athletic person. Okay. So as we move on, we start talking about architecture. One of the earliest sites where we start to see architecture is a place called Thermos, sometimes called Thermon or Thermion. Uh, and this is one of the first true Greek temples. Here you can see it. This is the temple we're talking about right here. And it was built right over the top of some of those kind of herons, those ancestor shrines. But this thing's quite a bit larger than those ancestor shrines and a lot more sophisticated. It has a pretty straightforward, simple uh, floor plan. It has an outer foundation that supported columns and a porch that went all the way around. And then it had an interior section and it had a row of columns that went all the way down the center. Uh, they obviously hadn't figured out how to support a very large building at this point, so they needed columns to support the interior. When you look at this on a plan, this is what it looks like. So this is cleaned up a little bit, and you can see how it has that portico or porch that wraps around all four sides. So it has a large base so that you have a, a nice broad eaves that you can rest under. And then it has an interior space. Now, the Temple of Apollo at Thermon is one of the earliest Greek temples, but it's a really good one to study because it shows you how Greek temples evolve. And you can see all of the later Greek temples are echoed in its plan. And the building was also made predominantly out of wood and brick. It had a stone foundation, but most of it is wood, brick, with a little bit of terracotta uh, for tiles, uh, for the cornices, and for the roof, and also for decoration. So while this was made in wooden architecture, it eventually becomes the inspiration for all the great stone structures that exist in later Greek art. So we'll explain. So it's a good one to learn all of the parts of a Greek temple. The first big issue of a Greek temple is the center section, which is called the naos, or sometimes called the cella. Cella is the Latin, naos is the Greek. And this is the place where the god resides. This is where the cult statue of the, the deity being worshipped would reside. And then there's a very distinctive porch, which is called in the Greek the proneos, the thing in front of the naos, literally. Uh, Greek is pretty literal. It's a lot like German. You don't actually invent new words. You just take all the words and smash them together. Uh, and so you have a very clear porch. And for whatever reason, Greeks develop a great love of axial symmetry, where its thing is symmetrical side to side and end to end. And so if we have a proneos on the one end, a porch, we have to have another porch on the opposite side, which we call the opposthitibus. And the opposthitibus is really an interesting place. It exists for no logical reason other than to parallel the porch on the opposite side. Uh, and we suppose that this was used as a place for votives. The, the place where the god resides is very sacred and only functionaries and priests would be allowed in there. And so if you were an ordinary person and you wanted to give something that was close to the sanctuary of the god, but you weren't allowed into the sanctuary of the god, this is where you would give your devotion. We often see that a lot of these things have shields or spear points or helmets. If you survived a battle and you know your helmet spared you from a spear to the head, you would inscribe your name and the name of the god that you credit for your miraculous survival, and you would stick it in that uh, porch on the opposite side, the opposthitimus. Um, and so we think that's what that was for. And then it had a peripheral colonnade, which we call a peristyle. Style just means column. That's what it literally means. So a peristyle, like a perimeter, is what goes all the way around. It's a colonnade that goes all the way around the building. So this building looks very symmetrical. As you approach it from any side, it gives you a nice porch. Uh, on the front of the building, we have what's called a facade. Uh, that's actually a, a French word, but we don't know. I don't know exactly what the Greeks called it, but it, we call it a facade. And the facade is described in terms of how many columns there are across the facade. So this has five columns across the, the facade, so this is pentastyle. If you had a six-column facade, that would be hexastyle. 
If you had seven, it'd be half the style, and so on and so forth. Now above this is a triangular section we call a pediment. Greece gets rain. It's not like the desert. You know, all these uh, buildings that we've seen in the desert have mostly flat roofs. You can get away with that in the Near East because it's not very wet. But Greece is pretty wet. And so you had to have uh, a hipped roof. You had to have a, uh, a slanted roof to shed the water. And so that gives you a gable on the end uh, and a triangular zone. And this is often a zone for decoration or sculpture, pedimental sculpture. Now, the transition from the columns of the facade to the pediment and to the roof has, is this very complicated architectural piece that we call an entablature. And I'm going to actually blow this up and have you look at it. So the entablature is everything from the column to the roof, and it has two parts. It has a lower part known as an architrave and an upper part known as a frieze. And the frieze has two parts. It has a tree glyph and it has a metope. And then on top of all this is a thing we call a cornice. All of this is supported by the column capital below. Now the tree glyph and the metope are really interesting. And here, I wish I had a whiteboard. I usually do this on a whiteboard, but we'll try to do this here. So if you imagine these, these buildings were made out of wooden beams. And so if you had a wooden beam that was, you know, crossing the other beams, so you can imagine there's one beam going this way, you can see the wood there, you would have another beam on top of it going this direction. And that would expose the end grain here. That end grain would be susceptible to rot. And so you don't want that to rot, so you need to cover it up. So what do you cover it up with? You cover it up with this thing, the tree glyph right here. And that's all a tree glyph is. It's just a clay tile to protect the end of the beam so that it's not rotted. Well, you only have a beam every, you know, so many feet. You know, there's an next one over there somewhere. And you have an empty space in between. Well, you don't want animals or squirrels or other demon seed getting into your building. So what you'll do is you'll fill that up with bricks. But bricks are ugly. So you need something to cover that. And what they decide to cover it with is a tile. And that tile is often decorated. And that tile is called a metope. So that's what a metope is. So tree glyphs and metopes were actually very, very practical pieces of architecture that were designed to protect the architecture. But they quickly became a, a kind of formal decoration and zones for decoration. We can actually look at the metopes. Some of the metopes from uh, uh, Thermos have actually survived. Here is one of these metopes, and it shows these three women uh, seated. Uh, and then they have offering plates. Notice how vibrant their clothing is. Notice that Greek key uh, motif and the chevrons and the spirals. Uh, Greeks really loved vibrant clothing. We always imagine them wearing white sheets, but that's Hollywood. Uh, they actually loved things. We don't know who these three women are. Uh, these three women might actually have been gods, goddesses, characters in a story we don't know. But some of these people in these stories we can actually recognize. This one we can recognize because he has little wings on his boots. And he also has the head of a monster under one arm. This is Perseus. And thank goodness for Percy Jackson. Because without Percy Jackson, I'd have to explain Greek uh, myths to myth, mythology to a whole new generation. Uh, thank you, uh, Percy Jackson. So this is Perseus after he's cut off the head of Medusa and is returning and is coming back uh, flying with his winged feet. I love how his helmet breaks the frame and his foot breaks out of the frame. It gives him this energy. His pose is very stiff. He's got one arm up and one arm down and one leg out and one leg down. That's meant to indicate running. That's a kind of gesture or convention towards running. But it does show that these myths are very old. Now this style where you have metope, tree glyph, uh, on an entablature, sitting on columns, eventually creates this thing we call the Doric order. And the Doric order combines all of these elements that were originally created for wood buildings into stone buildings. And all the pieces and parts are there. This is uh, the Temple of Zeus at Olympia. We'll take another look at this. But notice that it has the facade. 
it has the entablature, it has the pediment. Notice that it has the pronaos and the opposthitimus. It has the naos. In this case, this one would be hexastyle because it has six columns across the front, which is a little nicer because then you have a space in the middle that you can walk into. You're not walking into a column. All of these are formalizations of what was designed for wooden architecture, but pretty quickly, Greeks start building this in massive stone architecture. Now, the Doric order is the first of these orders. The classical orders are a set of predefined architectural systems. Now, if you go into any art history class, they will tell you there are three orders, the Doric order, uh, the Ionic order, and the Corinthian order. And I hate to break it to you, but that's not true. <laughs> the Doric order, the Ionic order, and the Corinthian order were three orders that were uh, selected out by an architect, a Roman architect, writing by the name of Vitruvius, that he liked those orders. The truth is, there's literally dozens of orders, and it's not clear-cut where one order ends and one begins. It's not so much uh, clear categories as it's a broad spectrum. Uh, but go into any art history class and they'll tell you there are three orders, the Doric, the Ionic, and the Corinthian. Uh, well, you know, we, we get that because we like Vitruvius and we read Vitruvius. Uh, as you go back at and past, you realize it's not nearly as accurate as you might think, uh, that they'll fudge that a bunch. But we're stuck with it, so here we are. We're going to talk about it. We'll learn about the Ionic and the Corinthian at a future date, but let's just concentrate on the Doric. So the Doric was first founded in... Doria, which is on the opposite side of the Aegean Sea from Attica, and its characteristics are very, very clear. First of all, you can tell it right away by looking at the frieze. The Doric order is the one that has tree glyphs and metopes. So if it has this alternating pattern of tree glyphs and metopes, it's Doric. There's virtually nothing else that has that. There's a few, but virtually nothing else. The other thing is that it has what we call Doric columns. Doric columns are very, very uh, stylistic. We can tell them right away. They have a capital, and the capital is made out of two parts. The first part is the abacus, and it's a kind of square slab at the very top. And then the next part is the echinus, and the echinus is this swelling conical section that starts from uh, the top of the column all the way up to the abacus. The columns themselves are going to be fluted. They're going to have this nice, elegant, tapering shape but they're going to be fluted, um, but they're not going to have any bases. There's no kind of formal base of a Doric column. They just kind of end. So unlike the capital that has a, a very clear stylized section, there's no stylized section for the bases of these columns. They just rest right on top of the top stair of the temple. And the top stair of the temple is called the stylobate, uh, which literally means the base of the columns. That's where it stands. Uh, the other two stairs together are called the stereo bait. There's two stairs, there's, and there's the, the double base, and then you get up to here, and that's the stylo bait that they stand on. So there's no identifiable columns. So there's others that are fluted, but if you see them with these square abacuses and no bases, tree glyphs, metopes, 99 times out of 100, it's going to be the Doric order. Now I do have to take a little side note here to recognize that while we still think of Greece as this part defined by the Aegean, by the time we reach the 7th and 6th century uh, BC, we're starting to see Greeks move out of this area. Remember that in the Bronze Age, trade was very, very important throughout the Mediterranean. And the Greeks are a maritime people. They have boats. They get in those boats, they sail across the ocean, and they trade. They're a maritime uh, nation, and they're also a mercantile nation. They're not just one nation, they're several nations. They're a mercantile nation, they trade. And so pretty soon, they start setting up colonies everywhere. Uh, in North Africa, uh, elsewhere in the Black Sea, but also in southern Italy, and even all the way out as far as uh, Spain. So sometimes, ironically, the best place to look for Greek architecture isn't actually in Greece. Some of the best preserved Greek architecture is going to be outside Greece at one of these Greek colonies.
One of the major Greek colonies is a place we call Magna Graecia. This was settled by the people from Greca, uh, Grecoi. Uh, these were these people that came over from the area of Ithaca in Greece. And they settled, you know, this is Greece right here, so it's not very far. So they settled in the toe and the heel uh, of the boot of Italy, and also down here in Sicily, which is the football being kicked by Italy. And there were various different tribes. It wasn't just one Greek nation. Remember, the Greeks aren't a unified people yet. They, each city is its own independent nation. So we have various different nations, and you can see them, you know, called out here in different colors, claiming different areas. And one of the more important uh, places was a place called Paestum. And Paestum is right there. So technically this is in Italy, but this is Greek. This is a Greek colony. And Paestum is home to two of the very best preserved Greek temples, one from the Archaic period and the other one transitioning from the Archaic period into uh, the Classical period. So let's take a look at them. Uh, they're, they're commonly called the Temples of Hera 1 and 2, though we're not entirely certain if they were dedicated to Hera. Here's another view of them. So the first one is actually larger, and it's the older one. It's this one here. This is Hera 1. Here it is from the air. When we look at the Temple of Hera 1, you can see that it's a Doric in order. Uh, we don't have any of the preserved metopes or tree glyphs up here, but you can see that we have these gently tapering, swelled columns. There's no bases. We have this kind of swelling thing we call an echinus, and it's on a square block we called an abacus. When we look at this temple, you'll notice that it follows the more or less the same pattern we've seen before. Uh, it has the naos in the center. This one was uh, such a large temple. Again, they needed columns down the center to support it. So they split the doorway either way, and then they lined up the columns in the center. So this has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. This is non-style. This is a non-style temple. It has a proneos, uh, but it doesn't have a porch in the back. Instead, it has an adyton. This is where, instead of an apothetimus, apothetimus which is open to the peristyle, uh, it's a kind of separate room that's attached to the naos. But other than that, it looks very typical. When we look at the column capitals, here you can see those fluted columns. So they are fluted. You can see those little scalloped fluted edges. They go to these kind of very broad, squishy uh, echinus. And you can see the echinus is actually decorated, that there's a floral motif. Sometimes there's roses down there. You can see the square abacuses that they sit on. Here's another view of it. And you can see that decoration a little bit better there. So it's kind of just a subtle uh, you know, gesture towards a, a flowering capital. But it shows that they're thinking, I mean, again, these are very large, carved out of stone, but they're taking the ideas that they pioneered in wood and rendering them out into stone. The Temple of Hera II shows a, a little bit more uh, development on that same way. And right away, you should be able to recognize this as a Doric temple. Also, notice the scale these are massive, massive temples. So taking a look at the facade, there are tree glyphs, there are metopes, there is the abacus, there's no bases on the columns. This is Doric. And in this case, the pediment is actually very well preserved. This one is much more like your classic Greek temple. And here you can see it. Now this one is hexastyle across the front, so there's one entry. Uh, there is the naos, the proneos, the apostatimus, and the peristyle that goes all the way around. Now, unfortunately, uh, the naos on this is very broken down. Uh, the walls have fallen down, but you can still see the foundations of where it was, and the peristyle is still intact. Uh, incidentally, if you actually ever go visit this, uh, the fun time to go visit is in June. June is the month of Juno. Juno is the Roman counterpart to Hera. Hera is the goddess of marriage. And June is a very nice month to get married in. So if you go here, this thing will absolutely be covered in brides. Uh, 
uh, more so than the Salt Lake Temple. Absolutely insane <laughs> how many women get married there. So you'll see bridal people taking uh, bridal parties having photographs all over it. I was there in June. There had to be a hundred different bridal uh, parties there. It was crazy. So what are the origins of the Doric Order? So we know it originates in Doria, in this uh, region on, of uh, Greece that's across the Aegean Sea, which is in modern-day uh, Turkey. Uh, where do we get this? Where do we see the origins of these kind of swelling column capitals, uh, abacuses, and uh, fluted columns? Well, the origin is actually going to be Egypt. It's Egypt where we first start to see things now that look like this. Remember these? These are the reed columns from the Temple of Zosher. Uh, these are personified or imagined as bundles of papyrus reeds. Now these go out, as you can see. These are scalloped in the opposite direction instead of going in, but that's clearly what's being gestured here. That's also at the Temple of Zosher where we see the first swelling kind of column capitals that are kind of conical shapes that are meant to represent uh, budding flowers like lotuses or perhaps papyri plants. Uh, but there's a few things in between then and there. Uh, for example, if you go to uh, the temple, uh, the funerary temple of Hatshepsut and Deir al-Bari from the New Kingdom, you remember it, uh, there are colonnades down the side, we didn't take a look at these, but they're there, that are very simplified, stylized columns. These two are meant to represent bundled columns, but you'll notice that these, they're not fluted. Uh, fluting has, you know, kind of scalloped edges. These are faceted. They have very sharp edges, but you can see that they rest on blocks. So you have these simplified columns that this, this kind of progression of styles where the Egyptians and the Near East are moving through even more stylized uh, you know, forms. And it's obvious that the Greeks were seeing these, they were inspired by these, and they just made their own and continued to stylize them. Well, this brings us fully into the Archaic period. So the Archaic period is the first period of just truly monumental art and architecture since the Bronze Age, Bronze Age collapse. We don't see any large temples in the Orientalizing period, but in the Archaic period we see very, very large temples, massive temples. Uh, those temples that I showed you in Paestum, the first one was from the Archaic period, the next one was from transitioning from the Archaic into the Classical, and you can see they're just colossal. We also see some really interesting conventions of the human form. We see very rigid human composition. Uh, very tightly patterned hair and clothing, very rigid human form, and perhaps the most bizarre, the archaic smile. Uh, that the faces are going to look very mask-like, and they all have uh, a happy face. They all put on this very kind of silly grin. Uh, and you can see here how the, the hair is so tightly patterned. It's, it's really crazy. Uh, the origin of the archaic smile is a complete mystery. No one's entirely certain why they decided to depict the faces like this, and all of the faces are depicted this way. One of the theories is that uh, they wanted to show that uh, these things were uh, lifelike, and so, of course, only living people smile, so the smile indicates that they have this capacity for life. Uh, I'm not so sure I buy that theory. I think mostly it was a stylization that stuck they weren't really concerned with the realism of these figures and the lifelike quality of these figures. So I think it's a stylization that just kind of stuck. And so you have these very mask-like faces. But we have lots of sculpture from the Archaic period. Uh, we have architectural sculpture, metopes, pediments, of course. We'll take a look at those. Uh, but we also have freestanding sculpture in the round. Now, this is something that, again, is pretty unique to the Greek world. There are freestanding sculptures in the ancient Near East. There's certainly freestanding sculptures in Egypt. Lots of freestanding sculptures in Egypt. We saw some uh, huge colossal statues. But there aren't a lot of freestanding sculptures most in the ancient Near East. Um, most of the sculptures we saw are things like the Lamassu, the Shedu, the other figures. They're attached to buildings uh, or their, their relief. Or even when they're pretty much in the round like those Lamassu, they're conceived as relief statues that are turning a corner. Uh, 
but freestanding sculptures in the round are very common in the Greek world. And so this is one thing that begins to set the Greeks apart, freestanding sculptures. And there are two uh, types of sculpture that really stand out, and they are male and female sculptures, uh, and they're called uh, individually a kore, a plural is korai, uh, or a kuros, or a kuroi uh, is the plural. A kore is a female figure, and notice that the female figures are always dressed uh, at this point. Uh, and these are dedicatory statues, and they're usually dedicated to goddesses or to deities. You usually see the, the women fully dressed, and they're usually holding out one hand. It's holding out a plate, a vessel, or an apple, some kind of offering to the gods. These are religious dedicatory statues, not cult statues, not statues of gods necessarily and goddesses, but statues giving a dedication, a gift to the gods. So the way this works is uh, you have a plague. Uh, the plague is, I swear that just popped out subconsciously. I wasn't, I wasn't trying to be cute. That just came out of my subconscious. So you have <clears throat> a plague <laughs> and say this plague uh, is suddenly lifted. Uh, you would see this as a, mir a miracle uh, from your gods, so you would make a dedicatory statue to commemorate how this god had saved you from this event. But it could be anything. It could be a personal event, say that you had uh, were praying to a god for something, and you had success in, a, in, in some endeavor, and you would give this as a gift to the temple of the god or the goddess. The other one is a little bit more unusual, and the, uh, the Kuro statue, they're always male, and they're always nude. And they're also dedicatory statues, but they're not dedicated to a god. They're dedicated to a person. And they are meant to represent athletes and warriors. So again, nudity, at least male nudity, uh, is a very common thing in the Greek world because the male nude represents this heroic ideal. Men used to uh, perform athletic events in the nude. They did not go into battle in the nude. They did wear armor. But they would go into athletic contests in the nude. And so this was seen as this athletic and heroic ideal. And these are statues dedicated to, not surprisingly, heroes, athletes, warriors. So a young man dies in battle. Uh, they would make a statue and dedicate it to him. Uh, or somebody achieved some great uh, heroic act, uh, either in athletics or sport or in war, he would get a statue dedicated to him. So the, the, the female statues are more oriented towards cult practice and their, their religion, but the, the other statues are more dedicated to their personal heroes and their idols, their, their personal uh, you know, kind of heroes. It's far more personal. There's nothing like that in the Near Eastern world. They're either dedicated to the king uh, or they're dedicated to the god and not much else. So there is a development of these statues. These are both relatively early examples. This is the Berlin Kore on this side. You can see that her dress is very, very stylized. Uh, there are some folds here, but you know she looks mostly like a column. Uh, you can see this figure here has very stylized hair. Uh, the New York Koros, his, he's very wasp-waisted, um, but his anatomy is very stylized. It's not terribly realistic at all. They start to get more realistic as things move on. Uh, this is the Peplos Kore, uh, so named because she's wearing a peplos. A peplos is a particular type of dress. It was essentially a large rectangular piece of cloth that was folded over and then bound at the shoulders. So you can't see it, but there would there's clasps up here at her shoulders, and you can see how the top part of it is folded down. So there's the fold, and then it's tied in the middle with a girdle. Uh, one hand is broken off, but that's where an offering, possibly an apple or a fiale or a, some kind of plate or offering was made. Uh, the face is a little bit more naturalistic, but in terms of anatomy, uh, there's nothing going on. She, she looks like a stuffed sausage casing with a belt around the middle. It's not a very flattering look. She clearly has breasts, but other than that, uh, she's very column-like. 
And one of the things that's really interesting, notice that you can see the trace of paint on her eyes and her hair. Uh, all ancient statuary was painted. This is something that's also that Hollywood gets wrong and you could understand why nobody can really quite understand why you would paint these things. Uh, but we do have literary references in the ancient world that say things like, uh, this woman was as ugly as an unpainted statue. So, and of course we have evidence, uh, traces of paint. All ancient statuary was painted. So those beautiful white marble statues that you're so used to seeing, that's what they look like after thousands of years of uh, weathering and erosion. So why do we um, see marbles as white? Well, that's a Renaissance thing. Uh, because during the Renaissance, they were looking at marble statues where all the paint had worn off. That's what they developed a taste for. To them, that was ancient, antique. And then as time goes on, Johann Winckelmann, this uh, very important art historian of the 18th century, German art historian, he sees this as uh, a kind of noble thing, that when you see them in pure white marble, it reveals the material, and it has this noble simplicity. It lacks the distraction of color. So that's why we think Greeks were boring and you know, made all white statues and wore all white clothes, but they weren't. They loved color. They absolutely had loved color, and not just light colors. You can see that they loved absolutely just what we would consider almost garish color and patterning. So when we look at the human form, uh, particularly uh, you know, some of the anatomy, you can tell it's not especially accurate. Uh, again, we have those mask-like faces, archaic smiles, uh, kind of almond-shaped eyes. The hair is very stylized. Uh, I don't know what kind of uh, beard balm you got to use to get your, your beard this tightly patterned. Uh, think of all the time it might have taken somebody to actually... Uh, uh, patterned their hair to look like this. Every single curl is perfectly symmetrical. And the anatomy is not quite right either. Uh, this guy has a six pack that, you know, looks like it was uh, drawn by uh, Rob Liefeld uh, for Image Comics back in the 90s. <laughs> not exactly anatomically accurate. I mean, look at that belly button. Uh, it's not an innie, it's not an outie, it's not a nothing. It doesn't look, you know, human or accurate at all. But there is a kind of development as these things go on and on. We do see that they get a little bit more naturalistic. You can see the development. So this, the New York Kuros is, comes from about the 6th century. Uh, early 6th century, you can see very tightly patterned hair, uh, wasp-waisted, uh, very stylized anatomy. And by the time we get to the Anavisos Kuros, uh, which is probably dedicated to a guy named Kroisos, uh, you can see that we still have the patterned hair, but the muscles are getting a little better. You know, the Adonis belt, the obliques are getting a little bit more accurate. Uh, his epigastric arch is still a perfect parabola. Nobody has, uh, you know, kind of abs that look quite like that. His shins are a little sharp, but he's getting more accurate, particularly when you look at the face. Uh, the face is getting a little bit more naturalistic. So there is a development towards naturalism. As to where this posture comes from, this very iconic stance, while well, all of the uh, korai have a hand extended with an offering, all the kuroi statues have uh, one foot forward, knees locked, rigid, uh, and then the hands rigidly at the side uh, with, the left, uh, with the left leg forward. And where does this come from? Well, we don't have to guess because it's a direct copy of a stance, again, going back to Egypt. That's a very common stance. Of course, in Egypt, they weren't necessarily into nudity. Uh, Egyptians uh, liked modesty, and the pharaoh, well, it's a hot country, so he doesn't wear a shirt. Uh, he does always wear uh, a kilt. Uh, and so they don't have this fixation with nudity that the Greeks do. Uh, but you can see that the wasp-waisted figure, the very stylized anatomy, the one foot pop forward, the stiff posture, uh, the hands at the side, all of this is borrowed clearly from many Egyptian and Near Eastern prototypes. Which brings us to some architectural sculpture from the Archaic period. So off the coast of Greece, up here in what's uh, known as the, I think it's the Tyrrhenian Sea, uh, but it's right up along the Adriatic as we go up the Balkans, is an island known as Corfu. And the center of Corfu, 
is a temple. There's, it is from the air. And there's not much there today. But at the time, it was a massive, massive temple. The temple was done in a Doric order, but what really uh, demonstrated it as a significant temple was this enormous pedimental sculpture. And the pedimental sculpture is fragmentary, but it's still around. And here you can see it in the museum. I love this picture because it gives you a sense of the scale of how big these buildings are. And it shows you how enormous uh, this sculpture really was. So in the center, you have a, a very clear heraldic program. You have two lions, which always represent kind of authority and power, very stylized bodies. And they are on either side of this figure, which again, you should recognize from uh, mythology. She has a terrifying face, wild hair, and snakes coming out of her hair. She even has a belt made out of snakes. And she has these massive uh, hamstrings uh, and huge calf muscles. She has winged uh, shoes. So she's indicate that she is flying. Notice she has that same posture that Perseus had to indicate she has this power and speed and dy dynamism. This is, of course, uh, the Gorgon, uh, Medusa the Gorgon. And it was a very common feature that in the temple, in the pediment, and on the front of these temples, you wanted something to ward off evil, okay? So we call this apotropaic. It's like a pumpkin. The reason you carve pumpkins and jack-o'-lanterns is because they're supposed to ward off evil. So a pumpkin is an apotropaic gourd. Well, this is an apotropaic figure. It's this terrifying monster, but the idea is you marshal this monster from mythology to your defense, to ward off evil. It's a very common thing that you would see the head of the Gorgon, the Gorgonian, on breastplates and on shields in the ancient Greek world. So that's what she's doing here. She's meant to uh, you know, protect the temple and to ward off evil. And we'll notice that there isn't a kind of coherent program here. Uh, she has uh, her arms around her children. Uh, and one child is the uh, Pegasus. Yes, Pegasus is the child of uh, Medusa. And then another one is her, her, one of her children over here. So she's kind of given a story. But the lions are more or less heraldic. And then by the time we get to these corners here, we're telling a, a different story. We have a, a different set of mythology. So there isn't a unified program. There isn't a unified scale. Um, it's obviously a lot of decoration that's kind of shoehorned in where it is. I love how when they get out of this narrow corner, they just have this person lie down. Uh, they have this person lie down in this corner, just so he fits. <laughs> They're making the story and the person fit the space uh, rather than, uh, you know, kind of thinking about it. So the design isn't great, but the scale is impressive. So it shows that these things are getting bigger uh, and far uh, more impressive in terms of scale. So going back to Magna Graecia, so down here to Calabria. Calabria is the toe of the boot of Italy, and Sicily is the football that the toe is kicking. So this is Calabria right here, and this is Sicily. And there's two sites here that we'll probably be taking a lot of a, a look at that, again, were Greek colonies in Sicily, uh, Segesta and Salinas, that were uh, Greek colonies, and we have some very well-preserved temples there. Uh, but what we're going to look at in the moment is Temple C. We're not entirely certain who these temples were dedicated to, so they, they're just given letters. Uh, if we know the god or who they're dedicated to, we'll give the name, but if we don't, um, we'll just give the letters. So this is Temple C. It has a layout very similar to a typical temple. It has a bit deeper porch, and it has that adyton instead of a uh, opposthetimus. Uh, but we can see that it's the Doric order. And on top of this Doric colonnade, there are a series of treeglyphs and metopes. And so we have treeglyphs here, and a treeglyph here, and the metopes in between. But instead of being made out of terracotta tiles, now these are fully carved. Now, this area of Sicily 
was colonized, I believe, um, by characters, uh, by people who came from Achaia in Greece. And so all of the metopes here are showing heroes from the region of Achaia in Greece. Uh, and one of those heroes is Perseus, who's right in front of us. Uh, when we look at these metopes, they're very stiff. Uh, the figures don't tell a story. It's not like they're a comic book and the panel goes from one to the other. Instead, they're just little vignettes. They take and make a little vignette from each story and drop it in there for our benefit. Let's take a closer look at this one. So here you can see it, and it's the Gorgon again. So this is Medusa, and here is the story of Perseus and Medusa. So Perseus slays Medusa and then uses her head uh, to defeat Satus, this sea monster that's um, uh, threatening Andromeda. So we'll know this, that he has the winged, uh, you know, shoes. Uh, he has his sword. Uh, he's grabbing her by her hair and slicing off her head. This behind him is uh, probably Athena, probably one of the goddesses that's championing him on his way. Uh, what I love about this is even though you get a little bit of drapery here, it's very stylized. There's not a lot of naturalism. Uh, what I also think is interesting is the posture. Uh, it's almost like he was interrupted, like he's sawing her head off. And as he's sawing her head off, somebody said, oh, can we get a picture? Cheese! And they all look up and go, cheese, and smile, give that grin. And then after they're done, he goes back to sawing her head off. So it's it's very funny. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's not a dynamic narrative. It's just posed for us. And obviously what this is saying to the audience is, look, you know the story of Perseus, we know the story of Perseus, here's the story of Perseus. We're not going to tell the story, we're not going to act it out, uh, this is just something to drop it in. And one of the best evidences of that is that there's a use of what we call conflated or continuous narrative. Notice what she has under her arm. It's a winged horse. This is Perseus, this is a Pegasus. So what on earth is going on? Why does Medusa have Pegasus under her arm? Well, as I said earlier, uh, Pegasus is one of the children of Medusa. Okay, So the legend goes that after Perseus cut off Medusa's head, the winged horse Pegasus emerged fully grown from the bloody stump of her neck. Okay, I know that sounds horrifying. You know, Pegasuses, you know, they have this beautiful, you know, they're so beautiful, they're winged horses, uh, and they're, they're the favorite of little girls all over the world. Uh, and yet, uh, Pegasus itself was born from the bloody uh, neck stump of Medusa. Uh, that's a story, that's an that's origin story that's not going to show up in uh, My Little Pony for sure. Uh, so, but you may ask yourself a question, now wait a minute! Okay, so if Pegasus emerged from the bloody stump of Medusa's decapitated neck, uh, how is this horse here because her head hasn't been cut off yet? And again, it's a continuous or conflated narrative. That is, the artist isn't telling a story. He's just putting in all the elements of the story. He wants you to know, he says, yes, I know that Pegasus comes into this story eventually, Yes, she isn't here at the exact moment of her death, but I'm going to put her in it anyway. And we actually use this all the time. Uh, conflated narrative is a lot more common than you think, where you take different parts of the story and you put them all together in one big grab bag. Ever see a movie poster? Or the cover of, a, say, a fantasy or a sci-fi book? Yeah, you look at a movie poster, it has scenes and people and places from the whole movie. It, you know, it... it piles it in together into one big beautiful mishmash and you're not to imagine that it all is happening at the same time it's just a way of saying hey look at all the things that are in this story it's a way of giving a shorthand of the story so the artist lets you know say hey i know where the story is going you know where the story is going and this is really unusual because if you think back to syrian art or egyptian art they really liked to tell stories. They had a, a beginning, a middle, and an end. That They had all of the parts laid out in a narrative order for you. Um, but that's not true in the Greek world. In the Greek world, they just give you this mashup, this vignette of the whole story, 
and they obviously are counting on you to fill in the rest of the story in your head. You're a Greek. You know the stories. We don't need to show you the whole story. Here's this kind of vignette of it. All right. So we talked about uh, the Greeks, and we also talked about um, how they're not a unified people, but they do have a lot of common culture. And one of the most important locations to all of the ancient Greeks is a place called Delphi. Also one of my favorite places to visit in Greece. I've been there many times. It's a gorgeous little valley. But Delphi is important because Delphi is the site of the Delphic Oracle. Uh, Apollo has a temple here, and according to legend, underneath the sanctuary of the temple, gases would arise, vapors, from maybe a, a sulfuric spring, nobody really knows. But gases would come up, and a priestess, known as the Pythian priestess, would sit on a tripod and she would take the sacred artifacts of the god Apollo in her hands, a, a laurel in one hand, which is the sacred tree to Apollo. And here she shows her holding a fiale, a kind of offering plate. And she would sit on this tripod and she would go into a trance and she would uh, make these utterings. Then a priest would come and interpret those utterings and he would issue a prophecy. So the god Apollo is believed to speak through these priestesses at this location. And so while the Greek city-states all hated each other and fought many wars with each other, this was considered a sacred place and everybody had access to it. And so they would come to hear this woman mutter and then have it interpreted by the priest into a prophecy. Now, I'm not so sure why this was such a big deal to the ancient Greeks. Uh, I guess if you believe God is the God of visions, Apollo is the God of visions. So that makes sense that you would go there. But if you know anything about the, uh, the prophecies that were uttered by the Delphic Oracle, uh, they're kind of confusing and vague. Uh, one time a king goes and the Oracle says, if you go to war today, a great nation shall fall. And he assumed that it was the enemy they were talking about, but they were actually talking about him. So this is kind of... Uh, <laughs> double-edged quality to these oracles. Nevertheless, it was uh, a very important feature of religious life, and Delphic oracles pop up throughout Greek mythology, but also um, Greek history. Many historical figures came here. So, uh, And a massive sanctuary is built around this. So here is the Temple of Apollo, where the oracle would operate. And of course, because you have a sanctuary here, you have to have uh, a stoa where people can meet, a theater where people can enjoy entertainment. But the biggest thing is uh, there were also treasuries. All of these little buildings that you see here are treasuries. And a treasury, again, was a treasury for your town. So there are many, many city-states that would come here and they would make offerings to the god. But they wanted to make sure that everybody knew what their offerings were. They wanted them distinct. So on the road leading into the sanctuary, they would build little tiny temples that were treasuries. And these treasuries would hold votive objects. Uh, tripods were popular, but also spears, swords, golden statues, all kinds of things that were given as gifts to Apollo uh, is a way of saying thanks for uh, the oracle. And we'll be coming back to Delphi a lot. There's a lot at Delphi. But at this point in the Archaic period, we want to talk about this building right here, uh, the Siphnian Treasury. The Siphnian Treasury, again, was one of these city-states. Now, what's interesting is uh, Siphnos, uh, the island Siphnos is out here in the Cyclades, if you remember the Cyclades. So, you know, they're way off the mainland. But these people would come uh, to Delphi to get oracles. That's how important it was. That even people living out in the middle of the Aegean Sea would still go there. So, uh, the Siphnian treasury is one of the earliest treasury. It has a lot of unique features. And we're going to talk a lot about them. So, one of the unique features is that the facade of this Siphnian treasury is really unique. Uh, it has uh, a pediment sculpture. Uh, 
uh, let's tackle about the caryatids. It's one of the first examples of caryatids. Caryatids are female figures that act as columns. So these are the colonnades. So that's a really kind of interesting innovation. Uh, there's a pediment sculpture, and it's one of the first pediment sculptures that has a unified theme that isn't, you know, a mishmash or, you know, part and parcel like at Corfu. It shows a continuous story and narrative. And then, instead of triglyphs and metopes, we actually have an entire narrative frieze. And the narrative frieze here is the Gigantomachy. Uh, the Gigantomachy uh, is the story of the battle between the gods and the giants. So in early Greek mythology, you have a succession of gods. The first gods that come along are the Titans. The Titans are overthrown by the Olympians. Mother Earth, who is the mother of the Titans, isn't happy about this, so she sends giants and monsters to defeat the Olympians, and so the Olympians have to prove they really are deserving to be the gods of this world by overthrowing the giants. So, again, when it was painted, this is what it would have looked like. Uh, a really remarkable scene. Let's take a look at the pediment right up here, first and foremost. Uh, and so the pediment shows this story from mythology of this battle over the oracle uh, between Apollo and Heracles. Heracles is Hercules, so if you're familiar with the story of Hercules. Lots of stories of Hercules. So Hercules is a pretty buff guy, so just really massive legs, but they all have pretty massive legs. And he wanted an oracle for himself, so he's trying to steal the tripod, which is an important function of the oracle. Remember the tripod? Here's the tripod right there, just so you remember. So he's trying to steal that tripod, and uh, of course, Apollo, who's unfortunately his head is broken off, is trying to hold on. They're playing tug of war with the thing to prevent him from doing that. And then behind Apollo is his twin sister, Artemis. And Artemis is, you know, holding on to him. And then in the middle is Athena, who is trying to arbitrate the dispute. Uh, so the gods are bigger than everyone else, so they fit on either side. But if we go back to the reconstruction, you can see that on the side we have chariots and other figures that fit in, and they crouch down to fit the space. Uh, but it's a much more coherent story and a much more coherent use of this strange triangular space that we see in the pediment that we've seen up until this point. There is a kind of logical narrative. He's going, you know, this way, he turns to look, the fight happens. There's much more interactive dynamism between the characters. They're not just standing there and posing as at uh, Selenus. They're actually, uh, you know, interacting. Same thing as when we looked at this long narrative relief. We begin with a scene of the gods seated enthroned. You can see that some are facing back, some have hands raised. They are discussing things. And then as we get to, we wrap around the side, the frieze wraps around the side, we see the gods and the figures of the gods coming together. Uh, we have um, the various different figures fighting and battling and the gods coming uh, to, uh, you know, the battle. Uh, and when we look at it, you could see there's more of this dynamic action. I love this poor guy is getting it eaten by this light in here. You can see his face turns. It's a three-quarter view of the face. So instead of a, a face that's just profile, it's three-quarter view. Uh, here is Artemis and Apollo, uh, the twins, uh, and they are catching up to these guys. This guy's fleeing this direction while he looks in the opposite direction to go, oh crap, uh, he's about to get the bad side of it. And then you even have a body that's fallen here under uh, the battle. So you see a much more interactive narrative. You see a scene that looks like a coherent story coming together. And this is what uh, makes this so powerful. We see that they're not just posing figures. They're actually kind of creating a very compelling narrative. Okay. So the next area we're going to go to uh, is a tiny little island. And this one is off the coast of modern day Athens. And this is Aegina. And Aegina was another one of these city states. So this is modern day Athens. This is the Attican Peninsula right here. And so Aegina was a city just right off the coast. And there's a very well preserved temple. 
and Aegina today, sometimes called the Temple of Athena, sometimes called the Temple of Aphea. Aphea is a goddess of healing and uh, etc. But a lot of times these gods and goddesses get combined, and so you'll see it many different ways. I was taught Temple of Athena at Aphea, so we'll go with that. Uh, and you can see that it again is Doric. Notice we have triglyphs, we have metopes, we have Doric columns, no bases. Uh, and it follows the plan. Uh, this one's interesting because it has a back door out to the back porch. But other than that, it follows the basic plan. We have a peristyle, a proneos and neos, and then an opostheremus. Love of symmetry. And you can see how this would look in this model, that you have this very symmetrical building. Uh, and Greek buildings, they loved this symmetry. They really thought of them almost as sculptures in the round have a real three-dimensional sense that there is no bad way to approach this building. Notice that the stairs surround the entire building so that you can approach from any side into the portico. Uh, they really, uh, a Greek temple really is almost like uh, a large sculpture. And at the facade, there are, of course, these pediments, these wonderful sections that exist. Now there's two pediments on this building. And they're probably separated by 10 to 20 years in time. Uh, all Greek temples faced east. So the east pediment would be towards the entrance. So the door of the, uh, the door of the building would actually face to the east. So this is the eastern end on this side. Oh, excuse me, this is the western end. So this is the western end here. But the, you can tell it's almost impossible. I mean, that's the thing about Greek temples. They're so symmetrical. What's the front and what's the back? They look very similar. But the main entrance is towards the east. So oftentimes as they built these temples, they would start on the west end because that's the end where the sanctuary is. If we go back to our little diagram here, uh, this is the east end. This is the west end, and so the statue or the cult statue of the god would be here in the west end. So it makes sense that you'd start from the west end and build this direction so that you could have the sanctuary built up. Uh, but the east end being the most important part because it's the main entrance to the building, you may save that for last. And so something like that happened here. And so uh, they started work on this and started on the west end and the west pediment, but didn't get around to the east pediment uh, until about you know 10, maybe 20 years later. Not a very long period of time, very short period of time, but there is a development. And so this is a very unique building because it shows us the development of Greek sculpture in a very short period of time. It shows you how they are moving towards greater naturalism. And you'll see the differences between the East and the West pediment. So the subject matter here uh, is a very interesting uh, story going on. Uh, we'll start with the West pediment. The West pediment tells a story out of the Trojan War. Uh, the Trojan War, of course, is this very important myth to all of uh, the Greeks, but Aegina had um, a, a personal connection to the Trojan War, that several of the heroes of the Trojan War came from Aegina. And so there's actually two different battles depicted here. Uh, the battle on the west end is from the Trojan War that everybody knows. But there's a lesser known Trojan War uh, that happens that involves... Uh, uh, again, heroes from Aegina uh, from a previous time period. So the upper uh, one here, which is the West Pediment, tells the story of the Second Trojan War, uh, but this one actually shows the story of a battle from an earlier war with the Trojans, and it has several heroes that uh, are heroes that came from Aegina. So uh, it's a little bit of hometown pride, you know, basically, you know, you're going to build a, you know, if you're going to cheer for somebody, you're going to cheer for the home team, so why not? So this is the West Pediment construction, and right away, you can see that there's a huge increase in sophistication. For one, it's a single story. 
it's not piecemeal with smaller figures here doing their own thing that are completely detached from the central figures. All of these figures are united in a single story, and they're arranged in such a way so that they fit naturally into the space. Uh, we have Athena in the center, who is presiding over the battle, and she is standing here, and she is presiding over the battle. And so this is probably the, the battle between Telamon. We can recognize a couple of the characters. This is probably Paris. Paris was an archer for Troy. Uh, so that's, uh, you know, he was a prince of Troy, one of the guys who got the whole thing started. He's the one that made the judgment between the goddesses and brought uh, Helen to Troy. Uh, and this is probably Telamon over here. But you'll notice how as the pediment gets shorter, they make these warriors crouching uh, or shooting with one knee down. And then we have fallen warriors in the far corners. That's a very clever way of using the space and making it seem more natural. So we're going to take a look at Paris, and we're also going to take a look at this guy over here, uh, because he's a. we're not exactly certain about his identity. It's important to note that there are multiple reconstructions of this. Some put Paris um, to the left side of uh, Athena, so on Athena's left. Here's a later reconstruction where you can see that Paris has been put on her right. That's the problem. These statues fall down. You put them together. It's like a massive jigsaw puzzle. Uh, there are debates. So you'll notice that this guy over here uh, and Paris are in a different place uh, than they would have been. Whereas, you know, we get to this one and you can see that this guy has been tucked over here. And you can see that this uh, installation at the museum actually shows the alternate reconstruction. So there's endless debates. Eh, I'm not going to get into it. So we start in the center with uh, Athena presiding over the battle. Uh, Athena is always recognizable because she has this armored breastplate or mantle that crosses her shoulders and it has snakes on the uh, edges of it. And then two little holes there indicate there was probably a bronze piece that fitted on her breast. And this is probably the Gorgonian. The, um, this is the uh, head of the Medusa. And this is the Aegis. Uh, this is this magical breastplate that she wears over her shoulders. It's really kind of, and you see it her on her everywhere. Uh, she's presiding over the battle. When we look at the, the warriors, notice that they're pretty stiff. Uh, they're a lot less stiff than, you know, if you remember our, you know, kind of running figures that existed before with their very characteristic strange running position. These are a little bit more upright. They stand upright, um, but they are still very stiff. The muscles are all taut and flexed. Uh, notice that they're nude. Again, uh, Greeks did not go to battle nude. Uh, they actually wore armor. But again, they're nude because this is the heroic ideal. This is the heroic mode of these figures that come together. Uh, here is Paris again. And you'll notice that he's wearing a very stylized hat, a Phrygian cap. This is a cap that was associated with people to the east. And so since he is a prince of Troy, which is to the east of Greece, that makes sense. Notice that he is wearing uh, leggings and skins. He has tight fitting clothing all over his body. He almost looks like he's you know, nude, but nope, he's wearing skins. And this is, again, the way that archers and people of the east were seen. Persians wore leggings and tight-fitting clothing, and so they imagine him as being Persian because he's from the east. He's from Troy. Troy is to the east of Greece. Notice that in this reconstruction, you can see how brightly colored. And yes, this is what they think the actual reconstruction was like. Really quite amazing. He holds a bow because Paris, of course, was a very famous archer. He is the archer that uh, hits Achilles in the heel, and that's why Achilles ends up dead. And then we have this character over here who's one of these fallen soldiers. We don't exactly know who he is. But when we look at him, uh, he too had some kind of armor, probably made out of bronze or something that was attached to him in bronze. And there's a hole in his chest. And so the arrows and the spears were probably made out of bronze. So he probably has a spear in his chest. What he's doing is he's pulling it out. 
Uh, when we look at it, he's, again, a lot less stiff than we've seen before, but he's still pretty darn stiff. Uh, in fact, there's something kind of awkward about his posture. Uh, it's kind of funny how he has one leg uh, jauntily over the other leg. <laughs> uh, he doesn't look like a guy who's actually dying. <laughs> uh, doesn't look like a guy who's actually got a spear run through his abdomen, you know, his, his sternum. Uh, he looks like a guy who's just said, oh, hi. You know, he's just laying back, kicking back and relaxing. And one of the things that gives that impression is the mask-like face. It's, it's hard to, to, to look like you're dying or in the, the, your death throes of dying if you've got this big, silly grin on. Notice also the hair, how tightly patterned the hair is, you know, very, very tightly coiffed. Okay, so that's the West Pediment. But 10, 20 years later, they get to the Eastern Pediment. And the Eastern Pediment is very, very different. It shows, again, this first Battle of Troy. It's, you know, ways earlier than the time of the Iliad. Again, we have uh, Athena uh, presiding over it uh, and the battle and these figures um, pairing off. Uh, right away, you'll notice that it's extraordinarily fragmentary. We have very little of the statue left. In some case, just parts of legs. I have a few of the larger statues. Uh, poor Athena, we have just her head and a, and a part of her shoulder, that's all. Over here, we have another archer. But the archer, in this case, is identifiable as Hercules, uh, as Heracles. Uh, you can identify him because he has this kind of lion helmet. It may not be Heracles, but notice that we has, he wears armor. You can actually see the detail in the armor. This is a linothorax, uh, which is actually a type of armor that they used. So they're not all nude. Uh, but look at how the drapery, his clomis, his little tunic, is gathered up and bunched under the armor. Uh, and you can see how the folds of the armor, these uh, little lappets, these are called uh, paturgas. Uh, these are, you know, protect the lower abdomen and the legs. Notice how they bend over the anatomy. Notice too how the anatomy of the arm is a little bit more accurate. Notice how the tricep here is balled up the way it would be if your arm was extended. So while the face is still pretty mask-like, there's an increase in naturalism, an increase in detail in drapery. When we see these two figures here squaring off, for example, we'll see even more increase in naturalism. Notice that the pose is far more natural, that instead of them being stiff and just kind of being flat-footed, this one actually retreats uh, as the spear from this one comes forward. His arm is thrown back, his shield is thrown back, he seems to have been caught unaware, his body uh, leans back. Uh, notice how well-articulated things like uh, veins or muscles or the serratus anterior under the arm and the lats are, are much more accurately portrayed than we've seen before. Probably the most dramatic distinction is gonna be this character right here. This is, uh, again, another one of these dying soldiers. In this case, the dying soldier is tucked into the corner, just like the dying soldier of the other side. But it's a very, very different image. First of all, he doesn't have the awkward posture with one leg draped over the other leg. His face is downward. His body hangs on a shield. You can feel the weight of the body. You can see the veins bulging in the body. You can see the muscles in the forearm delineated. You can also see how the abdomen, you know, wrinkles as his body is compressed. Uh, this is a lot more naturalistic than we've ever seen before. The face, something is happening in the face too. The beard is still pretty darn patterned and tight. And we do have this vague archaic smile, but it looks much less forced. It looks, um, there is a sense of his impending death. Now he's, you can see he's got his hand, he would have been holding a, arrow or a spear that was in his uh, middle. So we're seeing a huge difference. And I want to point out this difference between these two figures, between an utterly mask-like face 
and a body that is moving towards naturalism but is still pretty rigid, to a real growing understanding of the human body and a way, a slightest, ever slight move away from the mask-like face. So this is a building and a set of sculptures that shows how we are, we're not quite to the classical era, but we're right on the cusp of the classical era. And the transition, this magical transition into the classical era is gonna happen right after this, right around the year 490, 480, we will see a really dramatic transformation. Right now, we're just getting a hint at it. Uh, between these two, you can see the tension. Something is happening, but we're not quite there yet. But we'll save that for the next lecture. Thanks so much. See you in the next lecture.